I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Dr. Martin Luther King, the apostle of nonviolence in the civil rights movement, has been shot to death in Memphis, Tennessee. Dr. King was standing on the balcony of a second floor hotel room tonight when, according to a companion, a shot was fired from across the street. Police were on the scene almost immediately. They rushed the 39-year-old Negro leader to a hospital where he died of a bullet wound in the neck. That's another episode of Blind History, the beginning of season two, and we start off with a giant from recent history, living history for some people, of the United States of America, Anthony Medera, CEO of Taylor Blinds and Shudders, Gareth Cliff, and season two of Blind History. I'm very excited about this. A lot of people have been giving us a, a few really good suggestions around who we should cover. This was one that we wanted to do before we started taking everyone else's suggestions. Martin Luther King, of course, a Baptist minister in America, most well known as an activist, as the main spokesperson for the civil rights movement. He was born in 1929. And there's an interesting story about his name. His actual name at birth was Michael. So was his father's, Martin Luther King Sr. They were both called Michael. The father went to Germany in the 1930s to learn about Martin Luther, the original Protestant, uh, he came back and changed his and his son's name. Incredible. Mm. Martin Luther King, a junior. Yeah, that's right. Well, the, the other interesting thing about him is that his father and he didn't have the best of relationships. I think it was probably true at the time for a lot of uh, young black men. Their fathers would beat them into submission and he said, I will beat you until you become something. But Those he were his exact words. But th- his mom was a great balancing figure. She was compassionate, kind, to the strict hand of senior. Mm-hmm. So in all intents purposes, what I believe is he had quite a happy childhood, but you know, interspersed with, with difficult times. He tried to commit suicide, apparently, by jumping out of a building. He did. He had terrible depression. People don't know this about Martin Luther King Jr. is that he, he actually grew up very tough. He He... He had a um, an interesting childhood too. I think his first girlfriend was a white girl, and she was the daughter of a German immigrant, and she was the cook in one of the kitchens at the college that he attended. And he fell in love with her, and he wanted to marry her. And all of his uh, friends and his, his his brothers and his dad, and they all said, "Don't you dare, because it'll make it impossible for you to preach to a black audience if they know you got a white wife." Racism goes both ways. So that was after he'd uh, realized that he wanted to go into religion. Yeah. Because previous, he was actually, him and his dad didn't really see eye to eye exactly what you said earlier. Because mm-hmm. uh, he, was, he really wasn't interested in, in going into to becoming a priest. And um, it was only later when, in college, that's right, where he took a Bible class. That's right. And that, that, that just changed his whole headspace. And it's just incredible. I mean, I would have liked to be in that Bible class. I mean, what happened, it was a completely transpired from there onwards and yeah, what he achieved he he was in the choir i think at the at the church with his dad for a long time and that was kind of where he cut his teeth and he he was a pretty good debater and uh and he was recognized as being someone who had a tremendous way with words early on and the and, ladies and the ladies <laughs> and and that certainly was part of his charm in the beginning he kind of swore off all that stuff when he decided he was going to become a preacher and even though he said he never really got over that German girl, he did marry Coretta Scott King. I think he married her in 1953, and they ended up having four kids. And he was quite a traditional guy, Martin Luther King Jr. He didn't really want his wife to become involved in the civil rights movement. He limited her involvement. He wanted her to be a housewife and a mother and preserve some kind of more traditional female role in his life. But she ended up playing vital roles in areas she stood in the front with him Mm -hmm. she took calls from john f kennedy that's right he called her i mean she was just thrust maybe willingly or unwillingly she's thrust into the forefront i just want to refer back for a moment to something else about martin luther king jr because there's so much about his life that's been turned into legend now we've seen some of it immortalized in film 
and in countless books. Um, but when his father went to Nazi Germany, or it was still Germany at that stage in the 1930s, it was part of the Baptist World Alliance, and he saw firsthand the rise of the Nazis, and he swore at that point that prejudice of all kinds had its roots in anti-Semitism, and he would never allow his children to be anti-Semitic. And it was interesting that Martin Luther King Jr. maintained that position until his death. Um, and it was an important part of what he wanted to achieve through bringing about the civil rights movement, but also through his pacifism, because he was a big follower not only of Jesus and of Christianity, but also of Mohandas Gandhi. He was very taken by Gandhi when he went there in 1963, I believe. But even prior to that, you're 100% right, I guess, he was he was definitely nonviolent. And, you know, his strategies worked. If you look at the economic protests that took place and the success he got from that. Well, let's go through some of them because they, they all deserve a mention, but there are too many to list. Um, the most important one that started it all off for him was in 1955, I think, with the Montgomery bus boycott. And, of course, that was in response to Rosa Parks being arrested. Rosa Parks was this woman who got on the bus like everyone else and uh, she refused to give up her seat to a white person, a white woman or a white man. And she was arrested. Um, and at that stage, it was the rule was that the black people had to sit right at the back of the bus or they didn't sit at all. And Rosa Parks, of course, has been immortalized too by the civil rights movement since then. But Martin Luther King was there with her. And, and he was one of the people who was protesting to have her released. Uh, in 1963, there was the Birmingham, Alabama protests, which, of course, um, you know, were, were in response to hideous segregation, Jim Crow laws. And then, of course, his big one, because I'm leaving some of these out, but his big one was in 1963, the March on Washington, from which uh, we, we can quote some immortal words in a moment or two. But that, of course, was the, uh, the, the event, I suppose, that galvanized him into the annals of history. And it was also just post that event in 1964 that he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his work against racism and against segregation. I really enjoyed learning about Martin Luther King Jr. And I see a warrior in him. Seriously, I do. And there were a lot of powerful black people in the time that wanted to be more violent, to to fight back. Sure. But he was a warrior. He enjoyed the battles. If you look how they proceeded in 382 days odd with with the protests in Montgomery and how he battled to fight them. And in Selma. And in Selma. It was big fights that in all intents and purposes, he won all of them for his cause. And he kept control on these very different opinions within the, 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 the black civil rights movement of the time. He was, he was strong enough to maintain his position as the leader and the figurehead um, in, in a time where there were lots of other people trying to grab some of that power. And he stuck to his guns till the very, very end. And, and, you know, it was two steps forward, one step back. And that's sure. what killed him. And another point that I took out was um, moderates. And if we talk about moderates, we can talk about moderates in business. We can talk about moderates in, in politics. And, you know, he's, he, he said he'd rather have an extremist than a moderate. Hmm. Because inwardly defiant, outwardly compliant, moderate. And it's so, so hard to turn and to change what's been happening in the past in history when you're faced with a whole lot of moderates. Hmm. You can't see the enemy. It's very, very difficult. And that's really one of the big things that I took out of, of Martin Luther King Jr. He was especially um, important because he was a non-racist. He didn't believe that it was a black struggle only. He believed that the civil rights struggle was for all of humanity and that what he was doing was representing all of America in coming to grips with their history of slavery and the fact that they'd inherited this poison chalice of, you know, segregation, the, uh, the, the huge disparities between the black and the white communities, especially in the South, where he was from. So he felt very strongly and allied himself with a number of people on the left wing, even some of the people who were in, in the intellectual circles who he wanted to mix with and include in his march. Uh, there were a lot of white people in there with him too. But in the end, I suppose because of all the reasons that we already know from history, he was forced to to kind of comply himself in some ways. You know, it was a difficult time. The, the, the Kennedys uh, had the, the White House and they were more or less sympathetic to him. But after that, not so much under Johnson. 
But Johnson did more for... Oh, for, in terms of enacting the enacting right legislation. Enacting the right legislation. Yes, he was a Southern guy. And, Correct. And Texan. King, in the beginning, at least rated him quite highly. I mean, they had some serious talkings. They had a lot of... Yeah, major disagreements. Meetings. Yeah, major disagreements. The Kennedys were very much for change, but they didn't understand it. So they, they hadn't experienced it. It was almost like silver spoon stuff, and they didn't they didn't understand it enough but isn't to this, want to change. Isn't this so true for so much of history? If we look at history with today's eyes, a lot of it looks bizarre and antiquated, and and you know, almost a bit naive. But it was at those times. I don't think anybody really knew the things that we, with the benefit of mm. hindsight, are able to appreciate. Yeah. They were kind of j- just dealing with the punches as they came, and that was very much true of Martin Luther King. Now let's go through some of his achievements. I mean, he had the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the Congressional Gold Medal, Martin Luther King Day, the third Monday of every January, was uh, announced to be a national public holiday in America by Ronald Reagan. Um, He's got streets, innumerable streets, schools, counties named after him. And of course, there's the Martin Luther King Memorial in Washington, which is absolutely beautiful. It's one of the most um, awe-inspiring of all the monuments on the National Mall in Washington. And uh, just to add, the posthumous Grammy. Yes. So that was that was in 1971 for his speech about why I oppose Vietnam, the war in Vietnam. Yep. And then also, I have a dream speech inducted in the Grammy Hall of Fame in 2012. He said, I say to you today, my friends, so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama with its vicious racists, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day right there in Alabama, little black boys and little black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and little white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. Magic. That's incredible. And and I listened to that speech recently now and... I have a dream, and he just oh. picks, increases it, and he increases yeah. it. I mean, I, and the people are going absolutely. You crazy. can't do justice to it. He was a he was a master orator, and that's where the the the, the religious man in him just came mm. to the fore. And you know, ever since then, because of course the the civil rights movement has has moved on to other figureheads and other people who proposed themselves as leaders. One of those people was Jesse Jackson. Jesse Jackson was actually present when Martin Luther King was killed. And uh, he claimed quite a lot more than was actually true. But the actual assassination, I suppose, is why he's remained such a powerful figure. You know, if he'd become an old man and kind of retired into the distance, I don't know whether people would have appreciated him as much. But we all feel his life was cut too short. It was definitely cut too short. And But he was going through a difficult stage. He was upset at the lethargy of change. And going, like I said, two steps forward, one step back. And then he was trying to revive his movement movement when he went down to Memphis. That's, um, you know, that fateful time in April. Well, he was at him. the Lorraine Motel at room 306, which was actually, eventually they, I mean, they were there so many times because they used to stay in motels as they would move from town to town. And they'd been in that room and Abernathy, who was his friend, the two of them called it the King Abernathy Suite at the hotel. And he was shot by James Earl Ray, who eventually went to jail for life. And he died in jail, I think, in 1998 of hepatitis. I don't think anyone would ever have forgiven him. But the last words of Martin Luther King, Ben, he said to his friend, make sure you play Take My Hand, Precious Lord, tonight at the meeting. Play it real pretty. Sure. That's incredible. Martin Luther King Jr., born in Atlanta, Georgia, and died in Memphis, Tennessee, 1968. And I don't suppose there's anyone in the world who would say that his influence has waned over those years. If anything, it's grown stronger. Thank you for listening to Season 2 of Blind History. This is one of the many episodes that we have planned for you, and there are plenty more to come. It's brought to you by Taylor Blinds and Shutters, only on cliffcentral.com.